Hi, good morning. It's good to see everybody here once again on this beautiful Sunday morning. We really love the weather we've been having lately. If you will, turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Uh, we're going to begin our walk through the book of 1 Peter. And as you know, we've been spending quite a while in the book of Ephesians. And there's a lot of things about the book of Ephesians that will help us and become sort of the foundation as we go into 1 Peter because there's quite a bit of similarity between 1 Peter and the book of Ephesians. It's, it's generally structured the same. You have first the blessings that we have as Christians, and then you have who we are uh, as Christians, the holiness of, of uh, the Christian, and then you also have, towards the end, the practical living of the Christian. And so what we'll find is, is that as we go through 1 Peter, we're going to see some similarities, but at the same time we're going to be able to add to what we've already learned in the book of Ephesians. So we're going to be building upon what we've already gained through the book of Ephesians. The book of 1 Peter uh, is a wonderful book, uh, a book that has been cherished by Christians for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, it's a book that is just, a, it's a beautifully written, the content of it is just great. Uh, there's so much in it that you can gain from the book of 1 Peter uh, that you can be benefited no matter where you're from, what your background is, uh, your age, anything like that. The, the book of 1 Peter is a very applicable book to all people. Um, it is a very valuable book, for one, because of the eloquent speech in the book of First Peter. That's one of the things that I value a lot in First Peter. I just love the way it's written. And to think about the fact that this book was written by Peter, who about 30 years previously was a fisherman, uneducated. He was found, uh, he was, he, well, we'll get into that in a minute, but you know, when, when he came to Christ, when he began his discipleship of Christ, he was just a common man. There would be nothing to distinguish Peter from anybody else in Palestine at the time. But as you read this book, you see a man who had been touched by God and a person who had matured in God. When you read uh, John chapter 21, and you see Peter there, and then you go to Acts chapter 2, you see a changed man. And the difference was that the Holy Spirit had come upon him. Remember, the, the disciples were in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit came down like tongues of fire, and it came upon them, and they began to speak in tongues. And at that moment, Peter had changed. Acts chapter 2 contains one of the most beautifully uh, spoken words about the gospel. And, and you just see a change instantaneously by Peter. A Peter who was once ashamed of Christ, denied him three times, now goes out and proclaims him and even is thrown into prison several times in the book of Acts on his behalf. But not only because of the Holy Spirit that came upon him, but also because in 1 Peter we have the aged uh, Peter. Uh, he has already gone through uh, some, uh, a maturation. He's already gone through a maturing in Christ. And so what you're, you're able to do as you open up 1 Peter is to sit down at the feet of a person who, one, personally experienced Christ, the miracles of Christ, heard audibly the teachings of Christ, but also a person who had lived out Christ in his life for decades. And so I'm the type of person, I love being around older people. Um, they used to pick at me because the church that we came from had a lot of young people, but also had a group of older people. And I always tended to gravitate towards the older people, and they tended to gravitate towards me because I just enjoy... Being around people who have been there and done that, that, you know, they know what the Christian life is all about. There's a, there's a calm about them. They've, they've, there's nothing, seems like nothing shocks them because they basically have experienced it all. And there's just something good about that. And, and there's uh, a perspective, too, that the older people have that uh, is valuable to you no matter what age you are. And here we have Peter, an, an older apostle, a person, again, who has been there and done that. And he can look at things from the perspective of the things that he has gone through, what he has experienced, the things that he has personally heard from Christ, and the things that he had been personally inspired by the Holy Spirit with. And so the content is just beautiful and lovely, and one that we can all uh, gain from. But then also, as mentioned, the scope of the book also makes it a book worthy of studying. Because as you look at the scope of the book of First Peter, you have, uh, for one, you have uh, doctrine. It's, a, it's very heavy on doctrine. You can go, if you want to, matter of fact, uh, just in the first chapter, you have the Trinity mentioned uh, in 
in verse 2. You have the atonement of Christ as his blood is mentioned, the sprinkling of the blood of Christ uh, there in, in verse 2. And then also talking about the, the, the uh, uh, redemption of the blood of Christ. There's a lot of different doctrinal things that you can go through or go to in the book of 1 Peter. So if you're a person who maybe is new to the faith or you're a person who is experienced in the faith, but you want to finally tune your doctrinal beliefs, you can go to the book of 1 Peter and gain a lot of knowledge and information on that. And so it's very helpful in that way. But also within the scope of 1 Peter, you also have uh, very practical things. It's not a book where you just go for doctrine, but you go for practical things. Just as we saw with the book of Ephesians where the, the first... Uh, the first section of the first three chapters were all doctrinal, who we are based on what God has done for us, but then it goes right into the practical. First Peter is the same way. And so if you want to know how to be an appropriate husband, if you want to know how to be an appropriate wife, how to uh, interact with your employer, how we fit into the picture with the government, all of these things are contained in First Peter. And so uh, as we mentioned in Ephesians, it's not just enough to have the doctrine. The doctrine is the foundation upon which we build our lives and live out that doctrine practically. And people should see what we believe based upon our actions. And and 1 Peter does a wonderful job of doing that, transitioning into that. But then we also see in the book of 1 Peter a timeless message. We're going to talk about in a minute, you know, whenever you start a book, you always got to go through the date of the, when it was written and who wrote it and who it was written to. We're going to go through all that. But really, when you look at 1 Peter... You don't really need to know any of that because it's such a timeless book. Even if we didn't know that Peter wrote it, even if we didn't know that it was in the time of Nero and all these other things that we know about 1 Peter, you still would, wouldn't really lose anything because the content within 1 Peter is timeless. If you were a first century Christian being persecuted by the Roman government or you're a first uh, century Jewish Christian who has been persecuted by, by your fellow countrymen or you go through the medieval age, or you go even to the 21st century, uh, we all can gain these truths that are timeless and, and, be gained by, and gain something by them. Even in the prehistoric times before cell phones, people, people were able to gain knowledge from First Peter. To my kids, that is prehistoric. Uh, but no matter where you're from, no matter where technology has come, no matter where we've come as a human race, this is just basic, fundamental things about life and especially the Christian life that we can gain from. It's also something that's not tied to a particular uh, ethnic group. Uh, As you read it, as a matter of fact, scholars go back and forth. Was it written primarily to the Jewish people or to Gentiles? Again, it doesn't matter because no matter who you are, if you're a Christian, no matter where you've come from, whether you're from, from China, Scandinavia, wherever, wherever you're from, you can read these words and gain something from them. So they're timeless, they're all inclusive. Everyone can benefit from uh, the, this first letter of Peter. So now let's go over some of the, you know, the, the usual stuff. So we, we could look at, of course, who was it written by. It's pretty obvious. Some books, we, there's a lot of debate, you know, who wrote the book, but this one's pretty easy. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So We can't even argue over the fact, is it the same Peter that was an apostle? Because he designates himself as one. So uh, this is definitely Peter, and we'll look at that more in a moment when we actually go in uh, in, into the verses. Uh, But it's written by Peter. Uh, Also, who it is written to is pretty obvious as well. And that's also found in verse 1. It says, those who are scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, again, it doesn't designate whether it was to the Jewish people in these communities or the Gentiles. Most likely it was to both. These, all these communities uh, had both in their churches. They would have had Jews and Gentiles. And so if this letter was being distributed to them, they wouldn't have said, okay, only the Jews listened to this letter. Or only the, it, it was to the whole church. And so I believe that's applicable to both groups of people, Jews and Gentiles. But that was the particular people that it was written to. But again... The content in it is applicable to everybody who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. It it most likely was written around A.D. 65. Um, Scholars believe that because of the fact that uh, suffering, persecution, and things like that are very much discussed in 1 Peter. 
And therefore, they say it was probably during the persecution of Nero, which, happened, which started in AD 64. And even though Nero mainly persecuted just right there in the city of Rome, uh, it might have been that other people who were wanting to show their allegiance to Nero would also have been persecuting uh, yeah, Christians in these other communities as well. And so scholars typically put it around A.D. 65 uh, during that time. And so if that's the case, Peter, we don't know how old Peter was when he became an apostle, but we know this is uh, a good 30 years after Christ had died on the cross. So he would have had, again, some time to mature as he talked about these things. Where it was written from, again, First Peter helps us out uh, in that. If you go to chapter 5 and verse 12, 12 and 13, it says, uh, Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son, Mark. So it's from Babylon. Well, where is Babylon? Um, and it says, she who is in Babylon, probably talking about the church that was in Babylon, and there's a lot of speculation, again, about this, that maybe Babylon here is figurative Babylon, speaking about Rome or Jerusalem. But really, that imagery of Babylon being tied to either one of those groups doesn't really come until the book of Revelations, which is after 1 Peter. So it doesn't seem very likely that Peter would be borrowing from a metaphor that hadn't even been written yet. So it probably was a literal Babylon. Now, not the Babylon that you think about in the Old Testament that where you had the Babylonian captivity and they came and took over Jerusalem, led the people out into exile. This was most likely one of two places. There was a Babylon near uh, the Euphrates that was called Babylon, and then there was a place in Egypt called Babylon at this particular time. So it could have been either one of those places, but most people who choose either one of those goes with the Euphrates, mainly because as he goes out and lists the people that uh, he's writing to, he starts from east and goes west. As he talks about Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, it's almost as though that's the way that the letter is going to be carried, and it's in that particular order, uh, for whatever that's worth. But in either case, again, I keep coming back to this, it, it doesn't really matter. It's not a, a matter of faith or salvation or anything like that. It's just some, I guess, for some uh, interesting uh, things to think about. Now, as we look at the book, we're going to see... We're going to be following it under kind of one vein, even though there's a lot of things that fall under that one vein. And we're going to be looking at how the primary purpose of this book was for Peter to teach those who he was uh, writing to some things about grace. Uh, Peter, again, helping us out, uh, tells us exactly why he wrote this letter. First Peter chapter 2, in verse 12 that we just read, where he says, Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So the grace of God is kind of the, the, the thread that kind of runs through the theme of First Peter. And I really like Ryrie's uh, study Bible. I don't like a whole lot about that study Bible. But I do like um, the outline that they give because it follows very closely this idea of the grace of God. And that's what we're going to be roughly following uh, as we go through here. Uh, we're going to be looking at, of course, the salutation that you always have in the book in the first uh, two verses. We're going to be looking how the grace of God means a blessed life. That's going to be in chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. We're going to see that the grace of God means a submissive life. That's going to be found in chapter 1, verses 13. I'm sorry, chapter 1, yeah, verse 13 through chapter 2 and verse 10. We're going to see how grace means a submissive life. Something we already touched on in Ephesians, but something very important. Uh, where you're talking about to governments, to masters, to husbands, to uh, whoever else, the Christian life is a life of submission, or, or to the, uh, our fellow brothers and sisters at all. That's going to be in chapters 12, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 11, through chapter 3 and verse 12. And then we're going to see how grace means suffering. Grace means suffering. That's going to be found in chapter 3 and verse 13 through chapter 4 and verse 19. This might be surprising to a lot of people because when we think about the grace of God, we typically only think about flowerly, beautiful, you know, comfortable things. But when you receive the grace of God, a responsibility is placed upon you to bear out that grace in your life. And sometimes that means suffering. And that's going to 
cover a big section of the book of 1 Peter. And so even though we have it blocked off in a particular section, it kind of runs through the book as well. But then we see also grace means service. In chapters 5, verses 1 through 11, he's going to weigh heavily on the fact that we ought to be serving. Serving the church, serving each other, things like that. And then the conclusion in chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. So, grace meaning blessing, grace meaning meaning, uh, soberness in life. I I skipped that one, actually. That's in chapter 1, verses 13 through, uh, through chapter 2 and verse 10. Um, grace meaning submission, grace meaning suffering, and grace meaning service. Us having the grace of God means a lot of things for us, is, is basically what we're going to find. And it's going to run through this whole book. So, with, with that introduction, we're going to get into uh, 1 Peter. If you'll turn to chapter 1 and verse 1, we'll read the first two verses and then look at them in more detail. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with His blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Okay, so the first person, Peter. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but... I do want to kind of remind us of who this Peter is that's writing this book because maybe it will help us in the standpoint of some of the points that he makes. Peter was a person who actually came to or came into contact with Christ through his brother Andrew. Most of the time when we think about uh, Peter going with Christ, we usually think of Luke chapter 5 where they were fishing and Jesus said, you know, I'll make you fishers of men and then they get out of their boat and they follow him. But actually... If you go to John chapter 1, you see that there was some contact between some of the disciples and Christ even before that event. Uh, In John chapter 1, in verse 40, it says, One of the two who heard John speak, that's John the Baptist speak, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So that's really where Peter gets his name. But it's interesting that Andrew was the one that brought Peter to the Lord. Now, Andrew is not one of the apostles that you think of. That's, you know, there's no book by, by the apostle Andrew. You don't, in the book of Acts, you don't read about Andrew doing a lot of great and wonderful things. He's not one of the prominent, he's not one of the pillars of the church like James, John, and Peter. But you know what he did do? He brought Peter to Jesus, you know? Uh, And look what happened as a result of that. The great influence that Peter had on the church, the great writings that Peter left the church. All of that was because Andrew decided to go and tell his brother about the Messiah. And so what that should teach us is that you never know when you share Jesus with someone what ripple effect that will have. You may be bringing a person to Christ who is going to change Christianity, that's going to make a big impact on Christianity in America or or maybe in the world. You just never know. So I really like this story about Andrew, but, but it is interesting to find that Peter was brought to Christ by his brother, Andrew. And then that goes on and it talks about some of the things that they experienced with Christ, but Apparently, there must have been some type of separation that occurred. Maybe Jesus sent them to do something, and then he finds them again in the boat, because that's when we do get to Luke chapter 5. And you have that story where uh, Peter, his brother Andrew, some other people, they're out fishing, and Jesus wants to borrow their boat. You know, they've been fishing all night, and they're kind of cleaning their nets. They've kind of given up. They hadn't caught anything. And Jesus takes their boat, and he begins to teach out of it, and he tells them to go launch further. And they cast the net, and they end up bringing in this big haul of fish that the nets were breaking. And they bring it in, and Jesus says, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. That's uh, Luke chapter 5 and verse uh, 10. And that was the true call of Peter from that point on. He was going to be a fisher of men. Where he used to fish for fish, he was now going to fish for men. And, And the irony of it all is when you go out and you fish for fish, you catch something that's alive, and you pull it in and it dies. When you go fishing for men, you find that which is dead and it comes to life. Or they come to life. 
And so Peter was now going to be playing that role of bringing people to Christ, which would bring those who were dead to God back to life again. And so that was going to be his new calling. But you might also remember that it was Peter who was the one who was the most talkative among the group. Uh, he was the person who would just speak when it probably was best that he remained silent. But sometimes that worked to his advantage. Uh, in, let's see. In Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8, and you have based roughly verses 27 through the end of the chapter, you have where Jesus said, you know, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some of them say that you're a prophet coming back again. Some say you're Elijah, uh, so on and so forth. And he says, but who do you say that I am? And, and Peter, again, impulsively says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Jesus said, yeah, that, that's exactly right. And upon this foundation, I will build my church. But then Peter goes on to say, after Jesus reveals to him what his mission is, that, Pe- that, I'm sorry, that Christ is going to be crucified and be raised on the third day, Peter says, no, forbid it, Lord, don't let that happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man. And this story kind of typifies Peter, because one moment he does something that's just admirable, that's just great, and the next moment Christ is rebuking him. You might think about when they were on the boat, it was Peter that stepped out on the water. When all the other disciples were still kind of afraid, kind of wondering what's going on, Peter stepped out of the boat and he began to walk, something very admirable. But he was also the one who began to lose faith once he saw the wind and the waves and he began to sink. And Jesus says, oh, you have little faith. And he pulls him back up. Uh, Peter was just that type of person. Peter was also the one who is known uh, for denying Christ. After saying, uh, you know, maybe everybody else will forsake you, Lord, I will never forsake you. And he made that firm commitment that he was never going to, even if I have to lay down my life, I will not deny you. And the interesting thing is, is that he's basically denying a prophecy of Jesus. Jesus said, no, you will deny me three times. And he says, no, I will not deny you. That's just how confident he was in himself. But as you go through the story, you find that he does deny Christ three times and goes away weeping very bitterly. But we have Peter also being re- reconfirmed by Christ in John chapter 21. And there's a story in verses 15 through, uh, say, around 17, where Christ reaffirms him. He gives him basically three chances to reaffirm his love for him. And that's where he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Either do you love me more than these fish or do you love me more than these other apostles? Um, A lot of speculation on that. But in either case, he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he tells him, tend my lance. In other words, you are going to be working for me. You are going to be an instrument in the kingdom. He's confirming him, reestablishing him as having a major role in the kingdom. Then he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep. The third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord. He becomes grieved and he says, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And so from that point forward, Peter was confident that Christ had accepted him back in and that he was going to be uh, continuing this work that Jesus had called him to do. Then you get in the book of Acts, we've already talked about him being filled with the Holy Spirit, making that great proclamation of the gospel in chapter 2. And then you find Peter time and time again being persecuted, being thrown in prison by the Jewish nation. And somewhere around uh, the midpoint of Acts Acts chapter 10-ish, you see a transition from Peter to Paul. You don't have Peter emphasized quite a bit, but you still see him come up time and time again. But this is the same Peter that is writing this first book of Peter here. So he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that he uses, he now calls himself by Peter, by the name that Christ himself had given him. He doesn't say Simon, he says Peter. And that's always interesting. When when God gives you a new name, when God gives you a new identity, it's always important that you live in accordance to that identity, that you take that identity, apply it to yourself, and and live and work under that identity. We're going to find in 1 Peter that we have several identities as God's people. We're living stones, we're a holy priesthood, uh, we're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. There's a lot of titles given to us as God's people, but it's important for us to live under those titles and under the influence of those titles in our lives. 
But he calls himself the apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostle just means one who is sent. So he was sent by Jesus Christ. And now he's writing to those who reside as aliens. Another important uh, point here, that we as Christians are aliens. Now don't think about aliens in sci-fi movies where we come from another planet. Maybe some people would question whether we come from a different planet. Uh, but aliens here can also mean just exiles. It means, in the Greek, it just means a person who takes up residency in a place, where, but they don't call that place home. Okay? So, like, if you went to a hotel, you went on vacation, you're staying there, but that's not your home. That's not where you designate your residence as. And that's what we are as Christians. We are exiles on this earth. And that's a way that we need to view ourselves as well. That, and, and I've said this before, and I, I think it is true, otherwise I wouldn't keep saying it, but, you know, a lot of times we think of this world, whether we do it intentionally or not, but we interact with this world as though this world were our home. That this is where we are going to live forever. And the difference is between a person who builds a home, a residence, and, and another person who's just setting up tent, setting up camp for a little while. And that's how we should view ourselves. We should be viewing ourselves as just camping out for a while. Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he talked about his body as being a tent. That, you know, this earthly tent would be taken down and have a building uh, in heaven waiting for me. That type of thing. We need to view our lives here on this earth as a campsite, as something that we just experience for a little while and then we, we move on. If we think of this life as something we build, our whole hopes, our whole dreams, everything that we care about, all that we love is built upon this world and what we experience in this world, we're not going to be able to be successful in what Peter's going to describe as we move forward in this book. And when sufferings come, when trials come, when, when the pressure is upon us, it's going to be very hard for us to stay true to Christ if we don't have the right uh, viewpoint that we are just exiles here on this world or here on this earth. But he, he again uh, talks about where they, where they were, and he talks about them being chosen. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with His blood. So here we're going to we see uh, basically Peter showing how special they are, how holy they are. Not only are you exiles, but you are holy people on this earth, chosen by God Himself. And again, we get into uh, this doctrinal theological uh, debates that go on between, you know, well, does God pick and choose who's going to be saved? Um, is it us that choose him, or is it him that chooses us? And we kind of just have to take the scriptures for what it says. There's a sense in which he has chosen us, but there's also a sense in which we have chosen him. We want to not forget the fact how special we are based upon God choosing us, but we don't want to also violate uh, God's own nature. Because in Romans chapter 2, it says in verse 11, there is no partiality with God. And then we'll... We can also look at 2 Peter chapter 3 itself, where it says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. And so there's a sense in which, and then you could go to Romans chapter 1 verse 16, not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So there's this idea where the gospel message is given to all. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, anyone who is thirsty, let him come and drink. But then there's also this side where God has chosen those who would come who would freely come to him. And so we don't want to forget either one of those aspects of the salvation process, but it seems to be a way in which the apostles at the time just talked about those who are saved. It was just a way of designating them. If you remember in Ephesians, we saw this. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 1, where he says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And that calling was according to... Um, they're being chosen by God. As you looked in, in chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians, in, in verse 5, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will. So it's according to His foreknowledge. God know, knew before the foundations of the world who it was that was going to accept Him. And He, and he, made, he set up the system so much so that, or in such a way that those who would freely choose Him would be chosen by Him it's, it's, it's a complicated thing, hard to explain, but we just have to understand both sides of it. We are both chosen by Him, 
and he has chosen us. Well, one of my uh, professors in college, when I was taking a, a class in theology, he, he likened it to a, a marriage. Uh, if you have the, hu- the husband and the wife or the bride and the groom, you know, you could say, well, did they choose them or did they choose, you know, you chose each other kind of in a sense. That's kind of how he related it. But in either case, we, it, all it's showing really is that we are a special people chosen by God. We are holy before him. And it's according to his foreknowledge. It's not that God said, well, I'm going to set up a nation with Israel, and that's going to be my people, and then, oops, that messed up, so let me find another people to, to choose to become my people. No, this is all a part of his plan. That Israel was going to be his people for a while. They were going to be the one through whom the Messiah would come, and then it would be opened up to all, as we saw in the book of Ephesians. And it was all according to his plan. This was not plan B by God. This was uh, plan A. This is what he wanted all along. And then notice the Trinity here, the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Now here, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit isn't talking about what we typically think about sanctifying work, in that the progressive sanctification of the saint, you know, you become a Christian, and then you, become, you go through the sanctification process where you become more and more holy, more and more conformed to Christ. That is absolutely true, and that does happen. But that's not what's being referred to here. The sanctifying work of the Spirit is tied to the, the being chosen by God. And so when, when God gives you the Holy Spirit, it sanctifies you. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. As He enters into you and becomes a part of you, you become holy in His sight. And Peter himself talked about the impartation of the Holy Spirit based upon faith in Christ in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. When the people asked Him, what shall we do? They became convicted because they realized that they had crucified the very Messiah they were hoping for. Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So whoever the Holy Spirit comes to is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It is a work of sanctification through the Holy Spirit. Titus chapter 3, in verse 5, talks about this as well. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, so that being justified by His grace, we, be, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we are sanctified, set apart by the Holy Spirit. And then this is to lead us into obedience to Christ. To, going back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, All this is to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours to the fullest measure. It's all to bring us under obedience to Christ. The reason you're chosen, the reason you're sanctified by the Holy Spirit, the reason God has done everything for you was so that you would go out and obey Christ. It's not so that you can say, oh, great, I've been saved. I can go out and live however I want. No, it's so that you would go out and live in a a life of obedience, having been sprinkled by his blood in allusion to sacrifices. We'll talk about that more as we continue on in chapter 1, when the blood of Christ is mentioned again. But that, again, is a way of saying that you are sanctified. You are set apart because you've been sprinkled by the blood of Christ. Uh, a reference back to the sacrificial system. And he says, may grace and peace be yours to the fullest measure. And that's what he wants. So we're, we're running out of time, so we'll stop there. Lord willing, we'll pick up in chapter 1 and verse 3 next week. Uh, hopefully this will at least give us a little bit of a background before we really get into some depth into First Peter. Uh, if there's anyone here who would like to you know, give your life to Christ, to become set apart by Him, to become an exile on this earth, to become someone who has a different purpose, a different hope than the rest of the world, uh, please come forward as we stand and sing the song that Rodney has prepared. <laughs>